Welcome to Mission Minded, the podcast where we explore outside the box thinking and carrying out Christ's Great Commission. On this week's episode, we are joined by Steve Saint. Our sponsor for today's podcast is Dignity Roasters Coffee, locally roasted and packaged by the distressed to fuel each day. Dignity Roasters was born through a passion to partner with the distressed and the desire of bringing the universally loved beverage of coffee to your hands. To order your own coffee or to learn more about Dignity Roasters, visit their website at DignityRoasters.com. Now here's your host, Jim Tingler and John Spin. Hi and welcome back to the Mission Minded Podcast. I'm Jim Tingler, your co-host today with John Spin. Hey John. Good to be here with you, Jim. It's an exciting day. It is. We have a very special guest in the building. That's true. None other than Steve Saint. Hey, hey Steve. Hey Jim. Hey John. How are you? You know, I'm really, I'm really pretty good. If I can sit up in a chair or if I can walk, that's a good day. Anytime I encounter somebody and your name is mentioned, they always ask, "How how is Steve doing? How's he feeling?" Well, you know, everything's relative, right? Um, uh, Like the, um, what is that? Um, Oh, I can't remember the name, but um, somebody gave it a name when a guy in prison was beat up four times a day, and then one day he only was beaten by the guards three times, and somebody asked him how he's doing, and he said, great, (laughs) I missed a beating. (laughs) So I, it's a little bit that way for me. Getting out of bed um, takes a while, and um, fortunately, I have a live-in nurse. Married her 47 and almost 47 years ago, 47 years ago this month, and uh, she is the kindest, sweetest nurse I've ever encountered. Also very affectionate, which is nice. But um, yeah, I know. With Jenny's help, once I get up and get out and get doing stuff, then uh, I tend to forget the physical ailments. Although people don't. They see me staggering around. I think most people think I'm drunk. Um, so when I leave a parking lot, quite often I notice the other people in cars just stay there for a little while. <laughs> so what are the things that really... Um I guess physically stand out for you that that you struggle with um well i mean my my i have very little feeling in my hands and and arms and legs and feet except for little things uh you could probably hit my foot with a hammer and wouldn't bother me at all but uh i had a sand spur in my foot the other night Boy, it felt like some felt like somebody was ramming an ice pick up through my foot. So, nerves when nerves get damaged, um, some get hypersensitive and some just kind of go away. But I am I'm extremely thankful that uh, I'm able to drive and uh, went flying the other day in five six Henry the plane I flew in end of the spear and. Um, you know, it's it, if I had just had a little bit less movement in my hands, I wouldn't be able. I'd I'd be homebound, and that would be that would be rough. Um, people talk about work being um, oh a liability or drudgery, or I tell you what, I'd take a beating before I'd. I'd um, have to stay home all day, so I'm extremely, extremely thankful that I can get out and about. And every once in a while, scared Jenny. The other day, I was loading a 16-foot trailer onto my van, and then loaded tractor onto the the um, the um, trailer. And Jenny came out and said, "Steve, are you sure you should be doing that?" I said, "Yeah, I'm fine." And then I slipped in the gravel, and I was down on the ground, and I I can't roll over, and I can't stand up. So Jesse got me a uh, an Apple Watch. So I called Jenny on the Apple Watch, and I said, Hey, Jenny, 
Come out and see what I'm doing now. <laughs> and I was laying on the ground. I mean, I absolutely, I can, I could push a little bit with my feet, but fortunately, I don't fall all that often. And and for those who might not be aware, this has been a journey. I mean, since your injury, has it been eight and a half, eight and a half years? Wow. And so the, the, this is a long process to get to this point. And for those who might not have seen it, they can go back and watch the next chapter series and to see just the, the journey that you've been on to where you are today. Yeah, I still, it's still, when I try something new, I usually have to, like we're getting a new tractor and getting up on the tractor, there was no way I could do it. And then I found, well, if I get my left arm up on this part of the tractor and if I grab onto this handhold with my right hand and then if I get down as low as I dare get and jump, I can't jump, but I mean push off, I actually found I could get on the tractor. It just takes a while to figure out how to do it. It's a long way. Come a long way. And there was a time they weren't sure if you would ever walk again. Yeah, I can remember that. That that would be, um, although there have been times when I thought if I could use my hands, I might give up my legs, but that option hasn't uh, presented itself. So if I could use my hands when I need my arms and hands and then could walk well when I needed that, but that'll have to wait for heaven, I think. And, you know, I think, one of the things is you are getting a little bit older. <laughs> yeah, it happens every year, I think. I think we're reminded, too, just as uh, a new year starts and um, as we approach 2021 and, and looking back 65 years ago, um, that was another chapter in your life that um, was pretty difficult and a lot's happened since then. Yeah, in fact, in the Life magazine that talks about, uh, that actually Life magazine did three articles on um, what was they called back then the Alka story. And uh, there's a picture of me with a parrot that the uh, Waurani, their true name, not the Alkas, but the Waurani, put, up in, put in the bucket drop that went up to the plane. That was my pet, and uh, Cornell Kappa a time and life photographer took a picture of me with that parrot. I was five then. I'm uh, 70 next month, so, yep, 65 years. Do the math. Long time. You can tell, can't you? You've aged well, Steve. Uh, I've the, aged happily, that's for sure. Yeah, there's there's a lot of chapters in your life, and... You used to sign in uh, books, you the end of the spear book. You'd sign, God wrote the story, I just wrote a book, or I just wrote the book. Yeah. So I that's been a theme that you've had is to let God write your story, even if you don't like some of the chapters. And so coming in today, and, and this is really one of the things we wanted to talk about, was the reflections on 65 years later. And... Obviously, there's been a lot of chapters in your life since then, but just wondering if you had some thoughts. And I mean, it's been a long time. A lot of things have happened, but I'm sure continue to ponder it. Well, you know, back um, when I was five, my dad was my hero, and all I wanted was to grow up and be like him. And he had promised to teach me how to fly. And when I when I learned how to swim, he said then. Then he would take me um, into the jungles with him on flights. But he he said I needed to learn to swim because there's lots of rivers out there. And if you if we ever had a forced landing and had to make our way through the jungles, I'd have to swim. And then when my mom told me that Dad wasn't coming home anymore, um, I just couldn't imagine life. But uh, you know what back in 94, I guess we made end of the spear, and um, they were needing an airplane, a replica, or actually the same model as Dad's plane, but painted the same, and um, they uh, 
It was hard to find very few of those planes built, PA-14. Um, but they finally called and asked me if I would look for a plane, if see if I could find one. So I found one way up in northern Minnesota that had been in Alaska. It was on floats, but over a period of time we changed it back to be like Dad's. And I kept wondering, I wonder who's going to get to do the flying, you know, landing on the beach and all that, recreating Dad's... Um, exploits in the jungles with that old fabric-covered airplane, and um, they couldn't find anybody in the Screen Actors Guild, no, um, what do they call them, um, what do they call them, pilots that fly in? Um, a stunt pilot? Stunt pilot, yeah, and uh, so they called me one day <clears throat> and said, Steve, um, we need a pilot to fly, the, fly your dad's plane, um, would you consider doing that? And uh, it took me about a second to um, say, yeah, I, I'd consider doing that. So I got to do all the flying in the in the movie, and that was that was really fun. That was um, that was a, a real highlight in aviation for me. Yeah, that's that's certainly a an amazing opportunity to be able to do that, and that wasn't an easy task either. No, in fact. Um, when they when they called me from Panama, where we filmed End of the Spear, um, they told me they'd found a beach that was just like the beach that Dad landed on in Operation Alka. And um, I said, well, how long is it? And they said, oh, it's pretty long. And I said, uh, no, I'd like to know in feet and inches. And they said, well, we'll see what we can do. And they said, okay, one of the photographers on the uh, site has this site that tells you how long, how far away something is. And they said, looks like it's pretty long. I said, you know, they make these little ribbons with numbers on them. I'd like to have somebody stretch one of those out and tell me exactly how long. When they came back, they said, well, it's 400 feet long. And I thought, Dad's beach <laughs> was uh, 600 feet long. And they said, there's just one thing. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, the river runs across the beach halfway down. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, but there's a clear clear way to take off, right? And they said, well, actually, one end has trees on it, and the other end, well, it's got really big trees on it. <laughs> but it turned out we were allowed by the Panamanian government to cut out a a space out of one humongous tree, uh, like a baobab tree. They let us cut out a, a notch out of the, well, a, a clear way out of the tree so that I could fly actually through the tree where we'd cut the branches and land on the beach. But the other end, there was no go around. It was, um, you either had to land or you were in trees. And then I had to be flying with a helicopter you know, something I hadn't thought of before, but when you see a plane flying, maneuvering, the camera has to be in another plane, and they chose a um, a jet ranger helicopter. So whenever I was flying in the movie, I was flying along with the helicopter, and a lot of times we were down in the uh, Chagres River, um, both of us flying side by side inside, in between trees, and. Um, Sometimes I couldn't see. I remember calling Jaime on the radio and saying, Jaime, I see that there's a turn coming ahead, but the sun is in my eyes and I can't tell which way. He said, it's okay, just follow me. And I said, Jaime, I need to know which way to, we're going to turn or I'm going to fly into you. And he said, okay, let's make it right. Um, but a lot of, lot of exciting times uh, there and... So I actually did get to fly um, what what had been Dad's plane, and we even got the registration numbers back, which is a another great story. But I won't go into that one. Yeah, that's again. There's so many just chapters that um, again only God could write the story in your life to be able to reenact that yeah. scene of your father and wanting to to learn how to fly and be able to do that. And just just carry that out. Uh, it's amazing. And as you know, again, we've just wrapped up 2020. There's 
again, chapters that in our life that some are more challenging the, than others. And um, one of the chapters was losing Minkai last year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Minkai and I were great friends. Um, I just saw a picture of Jesse down in, he was down in Ecuador, and um, Dewey, one of the other men that killed my dad and Roger, P. Dad, and Jim back in 1956. And um, Jesse was down there with um, somebody, you know, we're building airplanes down in the jungles for people up here. And um, the um, the customer that was down there with Jesse buying one of the airplanes that we were building for him, uh, which is a way that iTech Ecuador supports themselves, he said, uh, so who's this little fella? And Jesse's a lot bigger than Dewey. And he said, um, oh, this is one of the men that speared my grandfather to death when when my dad was a little boy. And the man said, no, come on, seriously, who is this? And he said, yeah, that's who he is. And Dewey's just smiling, great big, of course, he didn't know what they were talking about. And um, Minkai was that for me. I mean, I read in my aunt's journals that Two or three times, Minkai told the people in the village where Aunt Rachel and Aunt Betty Elliot had gone in to live with the Waurani, he had told the people that he was going to spear Aunt Rachel. And um, one one was um, a warrior went off to hunt, and he didn't come back when they expected. And Minkai told the people and Aunt Rachel, they told Aunt Rachel that he said if... if uh, if a warrior is going to go out there and die, why should an old Kawudi woman, an old foreign woman, live? So he said, if he doesn't come back tomorrow, I'm going to spear her. But then um, then he became a, a Christ follower, and uh, his demeanor changed a great, great deal. I mean, from, from being an angry, um, devious man, he became a, a gentle man. Um, but he did, Aunt Rachel wrote my, my mom a letter when I, the first time I went out there, and uh, he saw that I didn't know how to shoot a blowgun, I didn't know how to make darts, I couldn't put the kapok on my darts so that you could shoot it in the blowgun, I didn't know what vine to make poison from, and he just went on and on telling my Aunt Rachel all the things that I couldn't do, and then he said, why is he so ignorant? And... Um, Aunt Rachel, oh, he said, who's going to teach him how to live? And Aunt Rachel said, um, she wasn't easily intimidated, and she said, Minkai, Bito Tomenga, Mampo Dube, Tanoni Tapa, Bito Abano Ponimi. She said, you, having spear killed his father, who do you say should teach him to live? And Minkai turned around and went back to his uh, thatched hut. But she wrote my mom, and she said, he came back this afternoon, and he said, it's true. Me, having spear-killed his father, how about if I myself teach him to live? So Minkai began treating me like a son, in their way, uh, adopted me, and um, even let me use his blowgun which his sons wanted to use. So his sons were always saying, take Minkai's blowgun. But Aunt Rachel had said, the one thing you do not touch is a, is a warrior's blowgun. But one day I, I thought he was off hunting and maybe he wouldn't know. So I took his blowgun, which his boys quickly took from me and gave me one of theirs about half the length, which was nice because running through the jungles with an eight-foot-long blowgun is... Um, something I never mastered. But when we came back, Minkai was sitting in his hammock right where I needed to hang the blowgun. And I thought, I'm in trouble now. Minkai didn't even look at me. And then I realized Minkai really was treating me like a son. Well, Steve, um, <clears throat> you know, the the story produced a lot of reaction you know some positive some negative and i remember when i was in college going through the old life magazine scene you know in 1956 you know go ye and preach the gospel five do and die 
and and that was at a time where you know missions Christianity had a higher cultural significance right and so there, even then you would have had some resistance and and I guess my question would be you know Ed Stetzer has made some comments of and you've even made comments about the um, John Allen Chow situation right. and and there's some you know controversy about that about you know was he using the best approach but Ed Stetzer's comments were in 1956 you know the the you know the the story coming out of Ecuador fueled people toward missions and in 2018 the John Allen Chow story is people are asking should we even be doing missions and so I'd just like to hear from you you know you you wrote an article which I thought was really good really challenging about the John Allen Chow and what would you say you know looking back uh, you know, 65 years later, seeing this all, you know, this is beyond my lifetime, but you, you've you seen it all from, you know, 1956 to, to now. What would your your comments be, um, you know, to the, to, the, to the church today in 2020, you know, you know in light of that and, and what you've seen? What would, you, what would you say to the church today in 2020, having seen it firsthand, you know, you affecting you as a five-year-old boy and, and where you're at today. Well, yeah, it, it has changed. I mean, Dad and his uh, four friends were treated like heroes. And, um, you know, all my life I've, I've rarely been Steve Saint. I've been Nate Saint's son or, or quite often Elizabeth Elliot's son. Um, I don't know how they figured that out, but... Um, Close enough, um, but but there, you know, the when Dad and his friends were killed, um, people were thinking, you know, we got to take their place. And I've had, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people, um, even Chuck Swindoll, I heard on the radio saying that he was, you know, had just joined the military and he didn't want people to know he was uh, a Christian and. And then he heard about Dad and his friends being killed, and he, he thought, okay, Chuck, it's time to get off the fence. But mm. um, now, today, it's not politically correct. I, I mean, I've heard people say, why don't you just leave those people alone? Leave them. They're happy. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, you don't know the history of the Waurani. I mean, 60% homicide rate over... Five generations that uh, an anthropologist, Jim Yo studied. Um, I mean, they were a culture of death. The oldest man in the Waurani tribe, the at least the clan that killed my dad and his four friends, was about my dad's age. He was in his early 30s, and um, he was, cons- well, he was the oldest man in that whole upriver group of clans of the Waurani. Um, they just, I mean, they just... When they'd get together, th- what they talked about is killings, you know, who killed who. And, uh, but, um, you know, it didn't start back then. The uh, controversy over whether we should obey God or should obey man started back in the book of Acts. Um, wasn't it Peter and John that mm-hmm. were called in by the uh, religious leaders? And they were yeah. saying, hey, what in the world are you doing? We told you not to not to be preaching, not to be talking about this uh, Jesus and um, and uh, Peter answered him and said, um, you know, you tell me, should we obey God or should we obey man? And when they were done with that uh, confrontation, it says, and I think it's Acts four, it says that uh, they they didn't understand how these two very simple and uneducated men could be answering so um, so capably and it says then they they realized that they these two men had been with Jesus and and it had transformed their lives um, you know somebody asked my dad um, well when he was flying over the jungle he said uh, you know you're, you're risking your life any any time that little engine quits you're probably going to die out there in the jungles and my dad said, um, you know, we are, we are not our own when we begin following Christ. We've been 
bought with a price. And he said, you know, this isn't so uncommon. He said, in the war, I remember we all understood that we were expendable. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to come back, but we had to go. And he said, uh, the same is true for sure. If we have to obey our earthly commanders in the military, how much more should we obey what God has told us to do? But I think, I think the um, the the um, the reason that it's not politically correct is that people think um, that the objective of missions is to go and force people to believe. I think Constantine, the Roman emperor, he tried that, didn't work well for him. It just doesn't work. What really works to um, to motivate Christ followers to actually follow him is persecution. And, um, you know, with 20 grandchildren, I've been really concerned about what this world here in North America is going to be like in their lives. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, persecution is coming and pretenders all go away when the persecution starts. And then I started thinking, you know, I think the church in North America is really going to become more active and uh, more committed to following Christ's commands. And um, we call it his great commission, his great command, but, I mean, all of his commands are equally of, of equal import, but the great commission that you find in every one of the Gospels was Jesus saying, all authority has been given to me, now I'm passing it to you. You go and make disciples of all men, which means... Go and First Timothy two two I think says um, go and teach people um, who can who can also teach others. It's it's a um, it's a multiplication strategy which we haven't been using in missions. But uh, you know, I'm getting a little bit long winded there. <laughs> well, the the multiplication um, is evident from that story. It, it's, again, one chapter, but God's continuing to write more in that. And yeah. it's it's been amazing to just see and be around, <clears throat> even working with iTech and hearing the stories and even speaking of iTech. I mean, it's a, it's a chapter of the story that we wouldn't be sitting here right now having this conversation if that didn't take place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, and Minkai, I mean, look at how the thing comes full circle um, I did 10 speaking tours with Minkai, um, not because of the movie, but it, the movie, End of the Spear, was a result of, um, I had a speaking engagement up in Pennsylvania, and Minkai and Tementa had come up for uh, Jesse's graduation from high school, and so I thought, hey, instead of me flying up to Pennsylvania, let's make a road trip which is great with Minkai and Jesse love each other and they're always pillow fighting and the motels and things. But uh, when it was my turn to speak, I thought, these people want me to tell about my dad and his four friends and they're being killed and about the Waurani. And I thought, here, here are Tamanth and Minkai. So I asked them, I got them to go up with me and I said, Tell these people how how you lived before and how you live now. And um, from then on, I mean, we just got requests to go and speak. I think Minkai and I spoke, but Minkai himself spoke personally, not, not radio, not media, but personally to probably about, um, my goodness, I would guess probably more than half a million people and and always left them with this message. He said, how long have you had, how long have you had God's markings? Because he would talk about how violent they were and how they killed everybody and how they killed each other all the time. And then he would say, but when we started following God's trail, then things changed. But he said, but the way we see those markings to follow that trail is when we do among it, the Bible. And um, he said, how long have you people had this? And then he would very gently, he would say, maybe if you had come and told us sooner, 
not so many of us would have killed each other and we wouldn't have killed the outsiders and we wouldn't have been killed by the outsiders. And mm -hmm. that's a sobering thought. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of other people out there, people groups that have no access to the gospel. And uh, it's not our responsibility to go and make them Christ followers. It's to go and offer them Christ's um, offer of um, forgiveness and, and eternal life. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, <clears throat> you know, that that's, that's a good point you make about, unfortunately, a lot of people use the term proselytization rather than what we would use evangelization of um, certainly not wanting to do anything out of a spirit of coercion. But, um, you know, I think that we're having, a, you know, like you said, a false sense of how wonderful life was for the Wadani, you know, yeah. and, and to think about, you, know, you can't argue with transformation, you know, and, and um, you know, that it really is interesting, you know, to, it's encouraging to see the, the transformation that the gospel message brought among the Wadani and the fact that their culture is still alive today because of that. You know, when you talk about a, the oldest man was 30 years old, and then when, you know, Menkai and uh, um, Tementa, some of these other guys lived till, you know. Chemo. Chemo is <clears throat> definitely in his 90s. Sorry, I meant Chemo. I said the wrong name. But <clears throat> how, how old was Menkai? Well, they don't, I mean, they count on their fingers and toes. If it's more than 20, it's just nangy, 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 lots and lots and lots. But Minkai has a son, uh, Oroki, who is, uh, that was one of my playmates when I was a kid. Um, and I've stayed in touch with him, you know, when I go down to the jungles. He's probably two or three years older than I am. And based on, you know, the age of children, and if you know how rampant the killings were during a time, because the more rampant the killings, the the later it was that men got married. Um, but Oroki is probably 72, and and I would guess Minkai was at least in his early 20s when he got married. Um, so Oroki, if you had 72 and... Um, and 22, you know, you, you, Minkai was probably at least uh, 89 and someplace between 89 and 93 when he died. And Kimo, they told me, Kimo was already a little boy running around and playing with spears when Minkai was born. So Kimo, who is still alive, um, he's probably, I mean, he could be as old as mid-90s. In a in a culture where life expectancy was probably about average life expectancy was probably in the twenties. Um, now you've got they they had almost no grandfathers. Nobody almost lived long enough to be a grandfather. Some of the women did, but um, Minkai had. Somebody people would ask him, "How many children do you have?" and he would start counting on his fingers, and then he'd look down to count on his toes. But he had shoes on. He had thirteen. He and his he and his first wife had um, four, and then she died of a fever. And he married. Well, he went down and killed Ompore's family with some of his friends, and took her as a as a bride. Um, and they had um, they had. Nine, I guess, um, thirteen children total. And then people, I'd say, please don't ask him about his grandchildren, because the last time I counted, he had fifty-seven grandchildren, and now a whole bunch of great grandchildren. So um, that their their culture. Not everybody became a Christ follower. That's a that's a fable that a lot of people like, but um, it it. It dramatically changed the lives, not only of the people who became Christ followers, but also the uh, life expectancy of the Waurani increased one year for every year for more than half a century. And I don't think that's ever happened in in history. Hmm. It changed their lives. Gave them a chance to live 
temporal lives, but also gave them a chance to choose to live eternally with Christ? One thing that, you know, I think about is that, you know, once the five men were killed, um, it would have made sense just to, to pack up, you know, from, I guess, a, a logical perspective. But your family was, was still in and involved in Ecuador and mission work. I mean, really your whole life. You know, one of the other widows, Barbara Udarian, um, her her parents said, Barbara, bring the kids. They had two children. said, bring the kids and come home and we'll take care of you. And Barbara answered them and he said, uh, you know, um, God's call wasn't just to Roger to be a missionary. It was to me. And she said, if God... If God, um, you know, moves me to come back to the States, I'd be happy to. But until then, I'm going to stay here where he called me. And uh, actually, all four of the five women stayed in Ecuador. The only one, um, Olive Fleming, who had no children, um, the other four widows asked her to come back to the States because there was just people were just clamoring for information. They wanted to know why would you go and why would you stay and why would you love the people that and care for the people that killed your husbands? And, um, you know, that's that story still happens today. You know, Jesse and Dewey, uh, USA Today um, journalist, when we were, Minkai and I were traveling with Stephen Curtis Chapman, uh, we did s- concerts with him in 65 cities we talked. Minkai and I talked. We we didn't do much singing. Although Minkai would chant with Steve at the end of each concert. But um, um, this man called me and he said, um, is it true that your father was killed by violent people, um, warriors down in the Amazon jungle? And I said, yes, sir, that's true. And he said, um, now you're traveling with a, with a tribesman now, but he's not one of that tribe is he and I said uh, yes sir he is and he said but he's not one of them is he and I said one of who and he said one of the men that killed your father and I said yes sir he is and he said you're traveling together you don't share a room do you and I said yeah we have to I mean guy doesn't know how to get in the room he doesn't know how to use the bathroom stuff because it changes in every motel and and uh, he said, I, I just don't understand that. How could you share a room with the man who killed your father? And I said, well, you know, that was only the first chapter. And finally he said, uh, but you know, somebody told me that you love him. And I said, I do. And he just reacted, I mean, violently this this journalist, he said, no, no, how could you love the man? That's morbid. That That's un, that's unnatural. How could you love the man who killed your father? And I said, well, my my children call him Mama. They call him Grandfather. Um, we're part of the same family, and I can't tell you how it happened. I said, how did you forgive him? That's, that's probably the question I get most often. And the truth is I never did forgive him. Um, you know, to forgive somebody, you don't forgive somebody who hasn't wronged you. And um, after Dad was killed, I mean, Dad knew and his friends knew that there was a chance they'd be killed. They had guns. They could have defended themselves um, against spears. But uh, so Dad was willing. He thought that they were special enough. And then every night when we'd get together for family devotions, which was a hard time for me because it was so obvious dad wasn't there. My mom would pray for those people. And then a couple of years later, my Aunt Rachel came and visited us, came out of the jungles to the edge of the jungles and told us that she was going to go in and live with the Waurani. She'd had an invitation. And I thought, what is wrong with you adults? They killed my dad and Uncle Roger and Pete and Ed and Jim. They're certainly going to kill you. But I saw that my aunt was really excited about it. And um, even as a little boy, I knew this is not natural. 
And then when I went out and Minkai uh, took me under his wing and started teaching me the things that I should have known by then if I was Waurani, then I realized he loved me and was willing to teach me the skills that in their culture he had to expect I would use one day to kill him and avenge my father's killing. So uh, it's like the Bible. It says, um, you know, God loved us while we were still weak. God mm-hmm. loved us while we were still sinners uh, and sent his son to die for us. Um, it isn't all that unusual. But f- as far as forgiveness, I, seeing the example of my dad, my mom, my aunt, um, it never occurred to me to forgive them. Hmm. Well, um, yeah, that's uh, that's powerful. And that's, um, yeah, I think that when you think about one of the things John Piper talks about, when you go, <clears throat> the world's attention is drawn to things that are radical, not the normal. And so, you know, that is certainly, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, wow, you know, you would, this is, there's a, there's a big story. There's something, mm-hmm. something bigger here of, you know, that understanding, you know, God's love, God's forgiveness, which allows you to extend that to others. You know, the, I think about the you know, the parable of unmerciful servant, you know, understanding our debt before God right. and being able to forgive others. And, um, yeah, just, you know, even, even Steve, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, that um, that was us. You know, that was, you know, you're talking about Romans 5, you know, that we were God's enemies. He loved us even then. So understand ourselves correctly you know there's that old saying hurt people hurt people i think the corollary to that is forgiven people i mean if we, if we really understand that even the even just calling somebody stupid is um, makes us worthy of god rejecting us but um if we really understand and, and as i've learned what god has forgiven me of I think the corollary to hurt people hurt people is forgiven people forgive people. Amen. Steve, you, you mentioned your aunt you know, going and living with the wild Donnie, and she spent the majority of her life in and around the jungles. Can you yeah. share a little bit about you know what she was working on and, and some of the things she did? Um, aunt Rachel... Um, she had um, seven younger brothers. Well, no, two older and and five younger. Um, so she really kind of kept the household together. My grandmother Saint was um, was weak, had tuberculosis. Um, my grandfather Saint was a stained glass artist. Did a number of the windows in the uh, National Cathedral in Washington. Um, so he was. Um, he was a little, I mean, he was gone a lot, and so Aunt Rachel was responsible, but she really felt that God had called her to be a missionary and that he had promised her when she was a teenager that he would allow her to take his word to people who had never heard, to a people group that had never heard. When she went through Ecuador and visited my parents on her way to Peru on her first missionary assignment, um, Dad flew her out into the jungles, and then he was going to another station, but another little village, but he flew way out and around a big area, and uh, Aunt Rachel said, Thanny, she called my dad, Thanny, why don't we just fly straight there? And she said, he said, no, Rach, this, there's a group of people that live there that if we, if we had a forced landing, um, we'd never survive. They'd, they'd kill everybody, every foreigner that enters their territory, and Aunt Rachel told me later, she said, I knew immediately that that was the people group that God was going to lead me to, and of course, she had no way of pulling that off. Wycliffe Bible translators that she was with weren't even in Ecuador then, but she told me, I knew that those were the people, Mm -hmm. and uh, actually, in a conference that some of the Wycliffe leaders had with the president of Ecuador, she was there, and the president said, um, Senorita, 
Si lo dejamos venir aquí al Ecuador, if, if we allow your organization to come here to Ecuador, what are you going to do? And she said, Mr. President, whether you say yes or no, God has told me that I'm going to come here and I'm going to live here and I'm going to go and I'm going to live with the Aucas. And he said, Senorita, you, you're a foolish young woman. You don't know anything about those people. They're Aucas. They're savages. They kill everybody that goes in there. And she said, yeah, but God has promised me that I'll go. And if he lets them kill me, okay, but I don't think he will because they need to hear his word. And he said, okay, senorita, if I allow your organization to come here and if you do go live with those people and they don't kill you, you send a message to me and I'll go out and I'll visit them with you. And he did. Um Aunt Rachel, Aunt Rachel never called living with the Waurani her work. She always called it her reward. She had been faithful before in doing what God had given her to do, and this was her prize. And she loved living with the Waurani. She loved their culture. She loved the people. Um, uh, and then it was when she died that I went down to help bury her out in the jungles um, and um, with the Waurani who had adopted me and had adopted her. And um, it was after we buried her that the Waurani told me that they had decided it was time for me, now grown up, uh, to come back and live with them. So tell us how that led to starting ITEC, because that's really one of the pivotal points in the story. Well, by then I had spent 20 years here in the States and having grown up in Ecuador, and I'm actually an Ecuadorian citizen as well as a U.S. citizen, um, it took me a long time to figure out, you know, how the values and how how to work in this North American culture. And um, so when the Waurani came to me after Aunt Rachel's, after, I mean, the same day that we buried her, um, and this, they, this was in the mid-90s? 94. 94. And they said, um, we've decided now, you come and live with us again. And I said, um, I, what, what, what would I do? What do you want me to do? And they said, we cannot do. They said, foreigners always want to come in here, and they do and do for us, but they never teach us to do. And because they don't speak our talk, they can they can do they can fix our teeth they can do you know other things uh, they can fix our radios, but they can't talk to the people and tell the rest of the people how to walk God's trail. And I said, you know, where's this going? So what do you want me to do? And they said, no, we said not do. We want you. And then they reminded me how ignorant I was when I had gone out there as a boy, and they had to teach me all these things so I could live like true people live, um, hunting and fishing and uh, following trails and knowing you know, what's dangerous and what's not dangerous. And uh, I, they said, um, now that you've lived with the foreigners and you know how to do the things that they do, we say coming now, you teach us to do the things that they do so that we can go and the people will see us well so that we can tell them how to walk God's trail. And um, I said, like, what things do you want to learn how to do? I mean, I was trying to think, you know, you people don't read and write, at least not on paper. You don't count above 20. Um, you know, math is <laughs> something that they just they didn't need to do. And now they were smart in their own and had good technology. They knew the ways of the jungles so that I was in deep admiration of them. But um, they said they wanted to learn the the beam will be at, the medicine thing. But I wasn't a doctor, so I said, what else? And they said, we want to learn to do the baga bia, the, the tooth thing, like John, like you do. And uh, I wasn't a dentist, so I couldn't teach them to do that. And I said... Uh, what else? And they said, and unless we learn to do the Ibobia, the airplane thing, how can we go from place to place and, and do these other things? And I thought, I do know the Ibobia. I do know how, you know, about flying. But 
I thought, you people are asking me to, you want to jump from the Stone Age to the Space Age in one jump, and I thought, that, that'll that never happen. So I said, let's talk about the Baga BSM or the two thing. And um, that was really the, uh, that was really the Waurani's, it was their idea they were saying, if you would teach us to do these things, um, like Jesus did. Remember, Jesus fed the 5,000 when there wasn't a place for them to go get food. And um, and then when Jesus left, then the, then the uh, disciples started, you know, God started doing miracles through them. And that's why the people followed Jesus. That's why the people listened to the disciples. And uh, the Waurani knew that if they could meet people's felt needs, like... Uh, Son Jamie says, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Um, They figured out if we could do the medicine thing and the tooth thing, if we could do the fixing thing, if we could do the airplane thing, then we could go ourselves and we could take care of our people's felt needs. And then they would see us well. And then we would teach them how to follow God's trail. If they saw it well, then they they too could follow God's trail. So the whole idea of training and equipping um, frontier people for ministry to their own people, both physical and spiritual, that was really the Waurani's idea. Um, So we tried it with them and found, you know, you don't have to go to uh, 20-some years of school to learn how to do the Baga Bia. You learn how to drill them, pull them, and fill them, and... And they 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 became extremely adept. And then other tribes in Ecuador started asking me, uh, "Would you teach us like you taught the Waurani?" And I said, "No. I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to reinvent the equipment and stuff for the Waurani." And then the Waurani heard, and they got upset, and they said, "Why do you say oh, You say yes to us, but you say no to the Quechuas, and you say no to the Shuar." I said, how am I going to teach all of them? And they said, no, no, you don't understand. Now you're thinking like a foreign again. You teaching us will teach the other people. And I thought, yeah, that's likely. You don't speak their language. You, I mean, you're you're considered the most behind, the most savage of all the tribes in Ecuador. Um, but then in, Minkai and I, long story, but we ended up in India with a... Um, with an IDENT team from ITEC, and um, uh, Minkai wasn't going to say anything because he knew they all could read, so they would know better. But then uh, a couple of the pastors that were learning to do the Baga Bia thing so they could go into Hindu communities without being killed, uh, they started pulling a woman's tooth, a canine tooth up here. I think that's what you call it, don't you? And I, and I said, this one right here, anyway. And they started pulling her tooth, but it had beautiful teeth, except for that one that had been abscessing, and you could tell it was bad, and it was hurting and needed to come out. And so they called um, our training dentist from um, Kentucky, and he went over, and he looked at that, and he said, man, I only pull a few teeth a year. He said, I do mostly cosmetic dentistry. And then he looked at me, and he said, uh, you said Minkai's been pulling teeth and stuff out in the jungles. He said, ask Minkai what he would do if he was going to pull this woman's tooth. Well, that's pretty abstract. Minkai realized nobody else knew what to do, so he held up his hands because everybody's wearing gloves and said, I don't, I don't have those things that you put on your hands. So I put gloves on him, and he pulled that woman's tooth. And uh, then... He put his hands on her face, and somebody was videotaping this just with a home recorder, and he put his hands on her face and started praying for her. Well, I had been supporting her jaw while Minkai was doing it and rubbing her jaw uh, because I had been taught that that would reduce the swelling. So I had my hands on her face, and he put his hands on her face over mine and uh, and prayed, and he said... Um, Father Creator, this tooth has been a problem for her, but it, but he said, but her big problem is inside that 
she doesn't know how to follow your trail. And he said, I fixed her tooth, but you send some of these other people to teach her how to walk your trail. And, uh, you know, I looked at those old warrior hands over mine, and I thought, you know, this really is quite a story. These are the same hands that drove a spear into my dad's um, head and killed him. And uh, here he is, gently praying for this woman, halfway around the world. Um, he can't speak their language, doesn't know their culture, but he knows that this woman, she had the red dot on her forehead, which I had told him meant that she had been to the Hindu temple to uh, say prayers, and they had given her the red dot. And um, it, it reminded me of um, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia when, when Aslan has died and Lucy and um, Susan, I think it is, the two little girls are just, broken hearted because Aslan um the lion has died and then and then Aslan starts coming back to life and they said Aslan Aslan how is it that you can be alive when you were dead and uh Aslan in uh, CS Lewis's words he says there's a there's a magic that the world doesn't know about and he said when when a willing victim or when a willing victim dies in a traitor's stead, life begins to work back or death begins to work backwards. Then then from death you start coming back to life. And I thought, uh, you know, that's what's happened here. Here's Minkai who said, you know, you, one of the people said, if you teach us how to take care of the people's physical needs, then we can teach them how to walk God's trail. And uh, then he, they said, you don't have to teach everybody. You teach us and we'll teach the other people. Here was Minkai way out in, in a little community outside of, I um, can't remember the city. That we Hyderabad. Were in. Hyderabad, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, in a place, in a community that had just a couple months before had taken a young pastor, Christian pastor, and had poured battery acid down his throat to kill him to show the other Christians, don't come here, we're going to kill you. And here they were having a, a dental clinic, and the people had a ribbon-cutting ceremony for the same people, and it was that when they came to fix the people's teeth, the people didn't care what their creed was. They didn't care that they wanted to... Um, proselytize them, you know, that they wanted to, you know, share with them the news of another religion that was foreign to them. They only cared that they had come to fix their teeth. And uh, here was Minkai out there in this little community outside of Hyderabad. Uh, and they they got in touch with me, the this group of pastors, and they said, now we've got another problem. And I said, what's that? And they said, now everybody's demanding that we come to their villages to fix their teeth, and he said, there's not enough of us. Uh, you need to train some others. So our team went back and trained uh, two or three of the the most adept uh, students to actually become trainers. And years later, I was in a Damo, another city in India, uh, just observing. And uh, when we showed up, two of the um, pastor uh, dentists had come from uh, Hyderabad, had 24 hours by train because they said, no, we're going to train them and you watch us do it and see if we do it right. It works. And Minkai was there, the Waurani's idea. It's actually not the Waurani's idea. It was Christ's idea. Hmm. Um, he picked 12 men of which 11 you know, stuck with it, and one became a betrayer, um, and he had to have known that, and he told them to each take a few and teach them who could teach a few. Um, that's the strategy that Jesus told us. He didn't just tell us to go take his word. He said, go and make disciples and teach them all that I've taught you. Well, thanks, Steve, and we appreciate you listening. 
you know, listening to the Wild Donnie and, and following up with that and uh, just committing your life to following God's trail and trying to teach others along the way. Well, I was taught by example. So, John, any closing thoughts as we wrap up today? Um, yeah, I just, I, I think, you know, I know these stories, I've heard these stories, but it's encouraging to be reminded of, um, you know, that I think we always, um, it's kind of like what you said, Steve, the, the positive of forgiven people forgive. And, you know, we oftentimes talk about consequence of disobedience, but fruit of obedience of, you know, five men and not just the men, but the families and, and, and Rachel Saint, and you see the fruit of their obedience 65 years later and in the immediate, immediately not really any fruit, just confusion. Like, well, what does this mean? How would God lead us? You know, God led five men to be killed and, and, you know, from a, from a worldly perspective, hard to see the fruit initially of that. And then, but now look at what you've seen and, um, just, you know, that, and even the, just all the, all the people that went into the mission field because of that story. So just, just seeing that God is at work, um, he's doing things that, you know, and you think about, you know, the Waudani of the most savage, the most, you know, think of an, almost an Apostle Paul type of, you know, here is the most unlikely convert and in, in what, what God can do. And so I think that ought to encourage us and challenge us and, you know, obedience today of what God can and will do through, you know, obedient lives. Letting God write your story, right, Steve? Yeah, I I didn't try to set out, but to to you know get some theme from my life. But I just kept seeing, as people asked me, and I told them stories of how I had seen God work in my own life, and in the lives of other people, the Wawrani, but other people around the world. That um, you know that old thing. I'm the master of my. I'm the captain of my fate. The master of my soul, or Master of my fate, the captain of my soul. That's one of the most asinine things that anybody ever came up with. We don't control. We don't control our lives. We don't control events in our lives. Um, twenty twenty has kind of shown us that. <laughs> yeah. So we can try to write our own story, um, and unfortunately, in North America, that's what m- most of us Christians have done. We write our story, and then when it gets messy, then we call God in to be our editor. But in Hebrews, it says God wants to be the author of our, you know, of our life story, not uh, not the editor. It's sort of like um, the uh, general in World War II um, who wrote a book, an, uh, an autobiography, and titled it "God Is My Co-Pilot." Yeah, that's that's. I mean, it sounds pretty good until you think about it. Okay, I'm I'm in control, and God's there if I need to take a uh, a break, take a nap, or something, or when it gets messy. No, I think um, if God isn't in control, then no one's in control. So let God write your story. On that. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Mission Minded Podcast. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Mission Minded. For more information on today's topic and show notes, please visit our website, itechusa.org. Mission Minded Podcast is produced by iTech. The goal of this podcast is to inspire conversations about Great Commission participation. The views, organizations, and individuals represented, interviewed, and discussed on the podcast do not necessarily represent an official position or formal partnerships with ITEC.